Oh, praise God this morning. This is, this is special. Do y'all feel it this morning? Yeah. You feel the Holy Spirit is right here with us. He's never left, but he pray, he's just manifesting this morning in our, in our music, in our fellowship, in our love, and bringing the brothers and sisters back here that hadn't been able to come. He's working his wonders. That's our Lord and God. I'm just going to get right to it. How about that? This morning, we're going to be in Isaiah. I'm going to get to it in just a little bit, but if y'all have your Bibles or your phones, we'll use it in the Bible. Go to Isaiah chapter 65, and we'll be in verses 17 through 25. I believe that's going to be the, the, the basis of the text this morning. And uh, this is what I'm longing for. I'm longing for heaven. Yeah. I'm longing for it. That's when, the, when it says you are, what is the word, uh, uh, groaning, when you're groaning for for the Lord, that means you're longing. You've grown our old body, our, our human body's longing for a better place, a place to be. And I know just where it's at. Yeah. And God promises that just where it's at place to us. And uh, just briefly, and uh, oh, Father, be with me this morning. Let me give this message the way you want it given. It's not about me. It's about you, Father, and your promises, which you always keep. Bless the words today in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, the promise is that God will create a new heaven and new earth. And that echoes out of Genesis 1, 1. And the first heaven and earth was ruined by sin and, and was in need of restoration. Amen? And uh, recreation. And from the very beginning in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 2, humans created, they were created as physical beings to live on a physical earth. Okay, that's God's plans, His intentions. And one day, this is where it's going to get good. One day, God will create, he, He'll create a new earth. A new earth removing all the effects, every stinking one of them, all the effects yeah. of sin that plagues this present earth as we know it. Amen. Amen. It's coming. Yeah. Hallelujah, it's coming. Now, and I'm going to tell you all those, brothers and sisters, we're going to get down to it. Now, all those that's in Christ, will spend eternity living in the new heaven and new earth. In Christ, which we are, hallelujah. And we, But we got work to do. We got some tracks to make to find those out there and share with them that that's ready for them too. We just need to show them what God has done for us, what how God has worked in, on us and through us for His glory. The new heaven and earth is everything that we loved about the old heaven and earth, what we loved, minus the curse of sin. Whew. Yeah. Ain't that going to be something? Creation's beauties are heightened and its pleasure strengthened and our limitations are removed. Woo. Woo, that's going to be something right there. We can, we're can we free. Yeah. God sets us free in that. But I'm going to tell you a little story. There's a 20-year-old a named Matthew decides to begin his sophomore year at Texas State University. And he's pledging to a fraternity. This happens a lot, amen, yeah. in the colleges. And during initiation, he drinks enough hooch to make an elephant fall. And uh, still, although he's 20 years old, he's a young man, uh, and he's two sport athletics in high school. He's pretty, he's, pretty, he's pretty good. He knows what he's doing. And Matthew thought that the hazing incident, the gauntlet was just part of an awkward way of getting initiated getting accepted. Well, he was healthy and this boy was strong as a bull and he could withstand anything. Yet somewhere in the middle of the night, with all this drinking and binging they was doing, he fell. He fell. Strong young man. Athletic. Invincible, we think. But he fractured his skull among the injuries. He was placed on a couch in the fraternity house, which that's kind of standard too. His buddy said, he's sleeping off. Well, it's about noon the next day that Matthew refused to respond to anyone, no matter how much they tried to wake him forevermore. Now, say you're here in church, and you find your normal seat where you like to sit next to your family and your friends. And you hadn't felt as great as your odometer turned you past 50. I can, I can resemble that. But while you felt fine on your way here, and you drop your kids off, you know, where they can play with the other kid. And you stop in the foyer and you stop and visit and talk to friends. Everything's good. But about the time that the, 
the welcome service is starting and the music starting, you feel uncomfortable. And you sit down while everyone else is singing and thinking whatever you're experiencing will pass. I'm guilty of that too. You take care of yourself the best you can. You've eaten the right foods and you've exercised, but then the unthinkable happens. The radiating pain in your back increases big time and you soon, you kind of black out. And before you know it, your head's under the seat of the person in front of you and everyone turns around in your direction. EMT's on the way. But in just a few minutes, despite the modern miracles of 911 and technology and quick response, your EKG is flatlined. It can happen, brothers and sisters, and you're gone. Now, at this moment, at this very moment, whew, you're either going to be enjoying a personal welcome into the greatest joy you've ever experienced, or you're going to be catching your first glimpse of gloom and regret, as the Bible tells us. When you study Revelations, that's going to tell you about some of this. But all through the Bible, God explains to us the joy of heaven and the alternative. But the Bible teaches that at your death, you pass through a one-way door into eternity. One way. You don't pass through it back and forth as you see in some movies. And uh, you, you don't try various uh, versions of eternity like it's your favorite ice cream at Sonic. One-way door. No, you pass through only once into eternity, brothers and sisters. And in the scripture, in Hebrews 9, 27, it says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. That's a fact. It's going to happen. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Because Christ is in me. Amen. And I pray that he's in every one of y'all, brothers and sisters. Yes. And then there's no rewinds. There's no mulligans. Because, brothers and sisters, we have had a lifetime to choose, and now we are eternally stuck with the choice of our lifetime. That may be a hard pill to swallow. Within nanoseconds, you're either regretting your life of choices, or you're staring at the very sweet face of holy Jesus. Woo! Amen, buddy. That gives me goosebumps. And I know this is a kind of a heavy way to begin a sermon, but it's reality. You know, it's reality, brother and sister. Let's slow down a minute. And I want to pause and I want to ask you three or four questions. How much do you know about what the Bible teaches about heaven? Good thought. This ain't not going to be a test. I just want to ask you the question. How much do you know? How much time do you think about heaven on any given day of the week? It keeps growing. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's possible for you to go to heaven? Y'all yeah. think about this. I like the hits, Bobbin. Yeah, you know, and I'm gonna be right there. I'm gonna one of them, them little bobbleheads on the dash of a '57 Chevrolet. I'm in agreement. And have you ever read a book that summarizes what the Bible teaches about heaven? I've read a few, but we don't know for sure till we get there. But we explain that it will be a joyous, great, beautiful, heavenly experience. Here's a good question: If God give you a choice of going to heaven this week or waiting another ten years, what would you choose? <laughs> I love it, Marty. Opinions vary widely concerning heaven and how you get there. There's a death row inmate from several decades ago. He wrote, being at home with God and his angels, that's a lot to think about. You know, he's, sit, he's sitting there at death row thinking about And the inevitable is coming, no matter how you get there. Maria Shriver, y'all heard of her? She was the niece of former President John F. Kennedy. And she said this about heaven in her children's book. Heaven is somewhere you believe in. It's a beautiful place where you can sit on soft clouds and talk to other people who are there. At night, you can sit next to the stars, which are brightest anywhere in the universe. If you're good throughout, throughout life, then you get to go to heaven. When your life's finished here on earth, God sends angels to take you up to heaven to be with him. More to it than that, brothers and sisters. More to it than that. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, but the relationship you have with Jesus Christ, that's what's counting. Would you want to know the truth of, about God and eternity? What if the truth was different from anything you've heard at any funeral? Oh, well, that'll bring your eyebrows up. It was reported, listen to this, it was reported by official Soviet Russian channels upon their entry into space in 1961. I remember that. 
that a Russian cosmonaut who first traveled into space is quoted. He said these words, I went up to space, but I didn't encounter God. Well, listen, that was a way, that was a credit way back then to fake news. Because Yuri Gagarin, or Gagarin, the first man in space, never said that. Instead, it was a quote, part of the Soviet communists in, in atheist campaign. It seems that Russian Premier Nikita Khrushchev made it all up. There we go, fake news, way back in 1961. And this happened and happened over and over again. What's the truth? The truth is in God's Word. Amen. The truth is in the Bible. And for those who deny heaven, brothers and sisters... And those who endorse heaven, we all long for heaven. You know, I think, uh, what is it, foxhole Christians? Foxhole atheists? There's both. You know, I've let an atheist get in, in the war zone, jump in a foxhole. What does he say? Help me, Lord. Oh, God. Okay. We believe what we want to believe. We're going to write what, about what we, how we're going to get to heaven. This is called motivated reasoning. That's a word I had to look that up. Most people's belief systems, what they believe in, are based upon what they desire and not the truth. Does that make sense? You know, you can, you can shake it and cut it and twist it. And sh God's word is God's word. Okay. Every one of us longs for a place we call heaven. Find three places in your Bible when you get a chance. Genesis 3, Isaiah 65, and Romans 8. Read through those chapters. Genesis 3, Isaiah 65, and Romans chapter 8. And it'll explain to you some of this stuff. This morning, I want to speak about the reason we long for heaven. And I'm excited about the aspect, the prospect, the probability that I'm going to heaven. I want to disabuse the notion that heaven is, is only a good thought for old people who, who are near the end of their lives. Wrong. Heaven is for everybody. Remember Matthew, the 20-year-old? We don't know. When our time comes. Uh, not every one of us. Rich or poor. Young and old. Male or female. Even Democrat and Republican. We all long for heaven. But to show you longing for heaven. You need to understand where you've been. We've been there. Me, me, I've, me and some of my buddies talk about this a lot. Let's say in Genesis chapter 3 verses 6 through 8. If y'all want to just note this down. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of Lord God walking through the garden on the cool day. Brother and sister, that's when God walked with them. Walked Person to person, one on one with them. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. They hid themselves. Well, in verse 17, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, listen to this. And to Adam, he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. From the ground we came to the ground we'll return. You are dust. And dust to dust you shall return. That's Genesis 3, verse 17 and 18. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? Pretty strong words. And, I'm, and when I mention Romans 8, let me, let me, y'all don't mind, do you? No. Good, I'm going to quote this to you. I'm going to go to verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's a promise, brothers and sisters. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the plans of childbirth, longing for heaven. Yeah. Remember I was mentioning groaning? And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly, eagerly wait for the adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. Yes. Jump up and down. Y'all can holler if you want to. This is God's day. He's telling us now. Our longing for something new. Ooh, I'm excited about that. Somebody told me a while ago I can preach till 5 o'clock. 
<laughs> Inside all of us is a longing for something new. Amen. I'm tired of the old. I'm looking for something new. And the Bible describes it, each one of us groaning inwardly. Everything goes out of date pretty quick, don't it? And it surprised me when I was young. I didn't think about it much. But, you know, last year's model truck car needs to be replaced if they change the body style for this year's cars. I'm not going electric yet, but I do like some of the styles. Surely you're not using a two-year-old cell phone. Oh, now I get some attention. Yeah. And students might be sure to get the latest edition of textbooks as they return back to class in a few weeks. That's true. You've got to have the new textbooks. Although I'm not, I don't know. I hadn't read some of them. Probably wouldn't want some of them. But you got, you know, there's change. Everything passes. Everything fades. Everything changes. Hairdressers will feature the latest styles from Hollywood. And how many are getting started on new diets right now? Don't raise your hand. How many are starting on new diets? You go in your closet and think, ooh, i got to get some new clothes. My wife's been washing mine in hot water. <laughs> well, every one of us have a longing for something new, not just new toys or new conversations or even new journeys, but something inside of us tells us that things are not right in this world. Yeah. Amen? And the reason everything fades, brothers and sisters, I want to share this with you. It'll be in Genesis 3, like I said, in verse 17 through 19. The reason we seek something new is because everything is decaying around us. Yeah. Everything is just, it's, it, the Satan has ruined it. The enemy has, has taken it down piece by piece. And he wants to take us with him. The Bible tells us the reason why everything's decaying is because God cursed the ground. Remember back in the scriptures in Genesis I was telling you about? Cursed is the ground because of you. That's sin. Okay? In pain you shall eat it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth to you. You'll eat the plants of the field, but by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you were dust, and to dust you return. That means that's going to be a hard life, brothers and sisters. We've got to work for what we survive on. And we got to do, we got to plant seeds as God tells us to plant. Not just in the garden with the vegetables and the fruit, but the seeds of salvation. The seeds of the, the truth of Jesus Christ. We have to be that garden. We have to plant the seeds for someone to know who, how powerful Jesus Christ is. Who how loving our God is. How rewarding it is to have the relationship with Him. Amen? Oh, for the creation was subjected to futility. What's the creation? Us. In Romans 8, 20. We see this in our lives today. Everything fades, brothers and sisters. Everything. Our, our beauty fades. Well, some of us. Our bodies fade. Amen. And our world fades. Have you ever driven by the house you grew up in? I've done that. My papa's house on the Brazos River. I thought that was a mansion of heaven yeah. when I was a boy. Yeah. Played under them old trees in that cool shade, hear them locusts churring. And I thought it was grand. I went out to the barn. It was, it was as high as heaven to shinny across them rafters in the roof into the corn crib, which I got whooped for. <laughs> it was big. But then when I got grown, I went back, and that little, that little corn crib wasn't but eight by ten. Yeah. And I could jump and touch the rafter I thought was so high off the ground. And now Mama and Papa's house is gone. Faded, changed, dozed down, never to be back. But there's a new house there. There's a new house there. The house where all your happy memories were formed from your childhood. You pulled alongside the front of the house to see how everything has faded, which I did. This is a personal experience for me. The house I grew up in as a kid, well, quite a few of them, they're not there anymore. But what joy I had with the comfort and the love of my mom and dad. Blessed to have them. Have you seen the place that you remember with so much joy sitting in neglect? Well, our homes fade, our work fades, even our best days at work. We'll look around to see the quality of all we've done fade. You know, the ground brings forth thorns and thistles, no matter what our best efforts are. And then we think, we know, we realize the power of death. Why do we say a hurricane's powerful? Well, because it has some of the power of death, a hurricane. Hurricanes can kill. 
Of all the powers you can find in the world, there's no power like death. It's all to be faced. Mankind can harness, can put, a, can put a limit on some of the power of creation. We can split the atom. That's what I'm talking about. We, have, we can do that. We can land a man on the moon, but we'll always die. The curse on the ground is death. The Bible calls death the last enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. But the Bible also teaches us that your death is a door to eternity. Amen. Ooh, and we long for something new, don't we? Yes. Amen. We long for eternity. We long for heaven. Yes. Hallelujah. And our longing is for something new and the reception of something new. Now, with Jesus Christ... Something dramatic happened to the universe. Well, he reversed that curse. Our Savior Jesus reversed that curse. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, redemption of our bodies. Romans 8, 23. Oh, Jesus put a whoop on that, didn't he? He changed that for us. And what changes? Well, when you embrace Christ by faith... Listen to me now. Great changes happen inside of you. Great changes happen to you. The body, which is once a workshop for Satan, now becomes a temple for the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says sin no longer has dominion over you. I love that in, in, in Romans six fourteen, When you experience new birth, you are profoundly new. Yes. Every one of us. And, and fundamentally, he changes our desires. Amen. He offers us hope, real hope. He wraps our lives with his love, his tremendous love that sweetens our lives. Ooh, makes me just, I feel good. You know, because God, the Holy Spirit, wrapped his arms around me. I'm telling the truth, brothers and sisters. I'm telling it like it is in his words. Fundamentally, the work of the cross and the resurrection alters the effects of the curse. We have the same spirit of life inside of us that was at work during the first days of creation. How joyful is that? I can't tell you how many moons ago that was, but we got it. Yeah, we, do. we got it when we received the, the spirit. Uh, he's made our souls new. That's good. We've been, we, we don't want to go back, do we, brother? We don't want to be where we've been. And we ain't where we, we thank God we're not where we was. But, and we're getting to where we need to be. The Bible refers to this as the First fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit is drop of heaven here on earth. That's a drop of heaven right here. The first fruits of the Spirit is a drop of eternity in the midst of our here and now. Just a drop. Yes, brothers and sisters, when you embrace Christ by faith, you experience a little bit of heaven. Ooh, y'all shout out. Yeah? A distinguishing trait seen, felt for God's people. Is there longing for heaven? Yes. But that, yeah, let it shine. That little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Amen. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Right. My God, your God. No, he's not ashamed. He welcomes that, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. Hmm. I'm going to have to sit down here just a second. What doesn't change? But God doesn't completely reverse the curse of life. Groan inwardly, inwardly as we wait the eagerly adoption as sons of redemptions. The groaning is a universal thing among God's people. Oh, everybody. There ain't no exceptions either. If you think you're an exception, stand up. Even for those who knew Jesus Christ by faith, there are still the effects of sin and the curse. Our bodies will get sick. It's a fact. Our minds will fade. Lisa can tell you. The quality and the craftsmanship of our work, best work, it fades over time. Even embracing Christ by faith, we long for eternity. We all long for heaven. That's what it's all about, y'all. That's what it's about. Now, there's a man named Charles Spurgeon. And I really love the writings of Charles Spurgeon. He said, the earth around us is a beautiful place and it shows the grand design of its creator wherever we look. The earth in ruins reveals a magnificence which shows the sign of a royal founder 
and the extraordinary purpose. Creation glows with a thousand beauties even in its present fallen condition. Yet clearly, clearly enough, it's not as when it came from the maker's hand. The slime of the serpent is on it all. Even though we still see God's creation, his beauty, the slime of the certain is slowly deteriorating, decaying at all. This is not the world which God pronounced to be very good in the beginning. Okay? And there's still tornadoes, right? There's still floods, volcanoes, avalanches. There's still the sorrow of our friends in Houston. You know, when the great flooding come down there. There's still misery all around us as we enjoy the great hope in Jesus Christ. It's still prevalent. But we have hope. Yes. We have faith yes. in Jesus Christ. Our longing for something new, the reception of something new, the wait for all things new. And now the sermon turns a corner. We're going to get down to the text I was telling you about today. We're going to be in Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. Feel the hope, brothers and sisters. Let your heart and mind soak in all the hope that's promised more than 700 years before the arrival of Jesus. This is where it gets good. This is where you can stand up. You can shout, stomp the floor. It don't make no never mind. God loves it. Listen to me. Verse 17. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. I like that part of it. The nasty is not going to be never more. Okay. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and crying and of distress. No more shall there be an infant that be in it an infant but who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old. Boy, God's turning that around, ain't he? The young man's going to live. The baby's going to live. We're going to live forever in the new world in heaven. And the sinner, a hundred years old, shall be accursed. They shall build houses and live in them. Now, I'm just wondering when he says, I go to prepare a mansion, what part of that are we going to have to build? I, never mind. <laughs> they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and in, in another inhabit. That means what's built for you will be yours. No one else will be in yours. Yeah. Hmm. No and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. In verse 23, they shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. That's what we are on earth right now. Okay. Before... Before they call, I will answer. Whew, I like that. While they are not yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the dust shall be the serpent's food. That belly sneaking booger. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. What a joy we're looking for. What a re oh, revelation to me right there. God's promises will take place. You're going to be in it? Ooh, yeah. Amen. You're going to walk in righteousness? Yeah. Best you can. You're going to live for God? Woo. Amen. Because he died for us. And he has, he has given that to us right now. Oh, I'm telling you what. This is something. This is something. Verse 24, before they call, I will answer. I love that. And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. That's what I want from our Lord and Savior. And the goal of all life. Listen to me. Isaiah paints a picture of where we long to go. I can see this picture now in my mind, in my heart. He shows us God's goal for the people he loves. The people who have embraced the Holy Spirit. Embraced his son by faith. Here's the life you've always longed for. The life that's in, eluded you. Always just a little bit out of reach. This is the life God is preparing for all his people. All his people, brothers and sisters. I'm loving this. I'm loving this. Just look at how many times we're told to be happy just by thinking about the new heavens and earth. It's the truth. God commands you to be happy. Just at the thought of this. Yeah, this should override any negative. This should ride, override any fear. Yeah, yeah. Rejoice for the day when, when there is no more curses. Woo. 
I'm ready, buddy. How about you? Yes, sir. All things new. The Bible teaches that our earth and heaven will be remade. Yeah. Now, heaven is going to be on this earth. Where we're standing, it's going to be remade. All the bad, the sin, and all is going to be burned away. We have heaven on earth. That's what it means. The new heaven is going to be on earth. Yeah. We're living where we're going to be living. But we're going to be living in a brand new, recreated, redone, love-filled, joyous time of Jesus Christ. The world and heaven is but temporary. Listen, but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for the fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Okay. Remember last week I said, you're not going to die. We're going to leave this earth, but you're not going to die. You're going to live forever. But the question is location, location, location. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Second Peter 3, 7 is the scripture I quoted. Also in Second Peter 3, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be sent on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. That's Second Peter 3, verse 12. Now, so the heaven that is now constructed will be remade. Does that make sense? Yeah. The earth that you are now enjoying will be remade. Where we're sitting today. All those in Christ will spend eternity living in the new heavens and the new earth. The new heaven and new earth is everything we loved about the old heaven and earth. Minus the curse of sin. Yeah. Minus the nasty Minus the hurt, the pain. Creation's beauties are heightened to a level we, can, we can't even think. Pleasure strengthened and our limitations gone. All this changes at the second coming of Christ. Woo! The first coming, he came as a lamb. The second coming, he's coming as a king. John Bradford was an English religious reformer and was later burnt at the stake. You know, that's persecution. Who knows? We might be burned at the stake for our belief and our faith and our walk in God. He said something you need to hear. If the universe out there, if this universe out there with all its canyons and seas and skies and beauties and infinities and immensities, if this nature is what God gave to his enemies, just think of what the kind of world he's given to his friends. Makes me swell up like a toad. <laughs> I, can, I can breathe it, brothers and sisters. If you think Alaska is cool, pun on words, what would be, if you think it's cool now, what would the glorified heavenly Alaska look like? Imagine the mountains and the lakes and the beauty in the skies. Imagine with me the joys of traveling the new heavens and the new earth. If fried catfish is good here on this ruined earth, how good will it be in the new heavens? Iredale ain't got a chance. Oh, if bluebell is good now. Woo, if it's good here, how good will it be when you're sitting down with Jesus Christ eating some? Amen. Amen. Let's jump up and down, y'all. But wait, somebody, somebody asked, are believers in heaven now? Good question, amen. Are believers in heaven now? And the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Just, no. Believers who die are immediately with the Lord. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Heaven is wherever the throne of God is placed. And believers who have died are with the Lord right now. But these heavens will be remade. Right. Here's a scripture. Revelations 21, 1. Y'all going to get through this in a little bit, Dan. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. And the sea was no more. Complete change over. The different heaven is a temporary heaven. The current heaven is a temporary heaven that will be remade. For those of you who are familiar with airports, think of it as a layover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I, have, I haven't flown much, but I can appreciate that word right there, layover. The eternal heaven is yet to be made, but we're commanded to enjoy the thought of it right now yeah. in this layover process. The resurrection, I'm fixing to close, brothers and sisters. One day, all bodies which you've turned to dust will rise again. All bodies. Think of it. Some of you will spend next Sunday with the angels. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. You're destined to spend another month here. Rejoice, for you will be with your Redeemer at some point in time. We all long for heaven. Wouldn't it be a tragic thing to hear about 
this place called heaven and miss it? Amen. And I tell you what, you want to live forever? Mm. The Apostles' Creed concludes with, I believe in the everlasting life, the life everlasting. I guess it beats the alternative, don't it? <laughs> yeah. But for many people, living forever sounds boring. After a few thousand years, wouldn't we get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over? It might be like kids at the end of summer vacation. I'm bored. I'm bored. Never will we be bored in heaven, brothers and sisters. We got a beautiful place to go to. We got a place made just for us. We got a place to go to to worship our King, Lord of Lord, Jesus Christ. It's a promise that will be kept. A promise that will be given and received by his children, by those true believers. Amen. Us. Yeah. Us. But we have a job to do until we leave this earth. We need to be telling everybody about our Lord Jesus. Amen. We need to be sharing our Christ. Right. Our Jesus Christ. And some people are going to cut you off, turn you away, turn a deaf ear. But you never know when that seed takes hold. That's right. But that's what God commands us to do. And one other thing, brothers and sisters, I'm going to challenge you today. When someone you know, you love, or a complete stranger looks down and out, pray for and pray with that person. That's right. Go to that person and put your arm around them or just sit there and talk. Just listen. Yeah. But let that person who's down, who's broken, whose spirit is, is down here, let them know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Twofold, Jesus Christ never leaves. That's right. And you're there also to love on them, to understand, and to lift your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you, Father, for the message, the lifting message you have given us today. Father, the promises you, that you've given to us, I want to receive those promises. But, Lord, I want to walk in righteousness for you and with you so that can be, that can be possible. And glorify you in everything I say, speak, move, whatever, Father. I'm excited. You can see that. You can feel that. And I'm excited for you. I'm excited for my brother and sister, Father. Please be with them today. All my people right here, your people, I'll be with us all today to manifest that Holy Spirit outside these walls. To let someone see us and know that we are of you. We are of you. The Holy Spirit's in us. And we want to share. We want to enlighten and teach somebody, everybody that just has a inkless, ink, the most smallest inkling of an opening of curiosity of who you are. Let us teach, preach, and show in our walk. And Father, I don't know if anybody's here today or not that's on that breaking point, that line right in the fence, almost there but not quite there, that has not received you as our precious, their precious Savior, Jesus Christ. But if that person is here today, I pray that you look into your heart if you have not received Jesus, today's the day. Now's the time. Please, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm asking that those who are on that line, on that border, pray this prayer to Jesus Christ. You're not praying to me. You're praying to our Redeemer, our King of Kings, our Lord. Jesus, Father Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've heard your word. I want more. I'm hungry for you. Father, I don't want to live the way I'm living. I don't want to think of the past. I want to think of the future. And Father, I ask your humble forgiveness. I know your love is over, overwhelming. And Father, I ask that you be with me today. Please, be my Savior. Be my King. Forgive me of my sins, Father. I need you. I believe. I know and I believe that you came to this earth, Father, as a human. So you can experience and feel everything I felt. But also, Jesus, I know that you, you were the example. You were the sacrifice to take what I should be taking so I could live to again. I know that now, Father. And I pray to you. My arms reached up to you, Father. Take hold of my hands. Take my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And be my King of kings. My Lord of lords. And Father... I believe the promise that you beat death. You ascended into heaven to prepare that place for me, a low sinner. But Father, I feel, I, I just can't go on like this. I'm asking for your forgiveness and your lifting. 
And Father, I pray this in your precious name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, if you hadn't received Jesus Christ, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but you raise your hand if you need someone to talk to, if you need someone to pray with you. If you want to accept Jesus as your Savior today, we are here, yes. elders, brothers, men of the church. We're in this together for your Redeemer. See y'all next Sunday. Love you.